Good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Wilson Center's Africa program, I would like to welcome you to the Wilson Center. Um, we, I will introduce the Wilson uh, the Center first of all, just a few words, and then uh, Mr. Graham, who will then uh, who is the moderator for this session, and uh, who will also introduce the panelists. Um, we will also the speakers will speak. The panelists will speak for approximately 15 minutes. Then we'll have the. Uh, Q&A, and we ask you that you do uh, please speak, uh, wait for the microphones because the event is being webcasted, uh, and um, otherwise the viewers won't be able to hear. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, it was established by an act of Congress in 1968 and is the nation's living, official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, as both a distinguished scholar, the only American president with a doctorate and a national leader, uh, Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policymaker were engaged in a common enterprise. Aiming to bridge the gap between the world of ideas and the world of policy, the Wilson Center is a nonpartisan institute for advanced study and a neutral forum for open, serious, and informed dialogue. So now I'll introduce Mr. Graham. Paul Graham is Executive Director of the Institute for Democracy in South Africa, IDASA, um, which is a nonprofit public interest organization headquartered in Pretoria. In, 1960, in 1996, as part of a Commonwealth group, he evaluated the 1995 South African local elections and has gained widespread global experience as an observer in the 1992 Angolan elections for AWEPA, the 2002 Jamaican election with the center, with the Carter Center, excuse me, and the 2004 presidential elections in Taiwan for the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. He's presently, uh, presently a member of the management committee of the African Democracy Forum, the International Steering Committee of the Community of Democracies NGO Process, and World Movement for Democracy. Thank you very much, and welcome to, to all of you, and uh, it's, it's very good to be able to spend these couple of hours with you to talk about uh, the, position, the present position in Zimbabwe and some of the challenges and opportunities that arise from that, both in Zimbabwe and in relation to, to the more general issues of democratization in the region. Um, I... I am going to introduce our two speakers, David Coulthard to my left and, and Karen Alexander. Some of you will have got the change in program, some might not. Um, Mr. Tendai Beatty of uh, General Secretary of uh, MDC Changarai over the weekend uh, had to unfortunately apologize. He is, uh, amongst other things, responsible for the uh, drafting of Article 19, which will um, ensure that the agreement which was signed on Monday um, becomes uh, appropriately constitutional. We are, as Zimbabwe watchers and as uh, citizens of Zimbabwe, both uh, pleased and uh, nervous, I'm sure, about the agreement which was signed only two days ago after very long and extensive uh, negotiations, interspersed by, a two, by an election and then a rerun, the rerun which uh, was extremely violent and uh, largely catastrophic in its, in its uh, conduct and uh, entirely unhelpful in its apparent outcome. And the negotiations then continued and they, they have uh, been 
going on and will continue to go on. But on Monday, a historic agreement was signed, and David Coulthard will speak to us about that agreement and uh, the challenges and opportunities that arise from it. Mr. Coulthard is a, an elected senator. He was previously a member of parliament, elected in 2000 in Zimbabwe and again in 2005. Um, he is a lawyer by profession and sat on the, was the constitutional technical support for MDC Mutambara, which is the smaller of the two Movement for Democratic Change factions in Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwean uh, political arrangement has uh, two factions of the Movement for Democratic Change, the larger and the uh, President Changarai, the smaller, and the President uh, Mutumbara. Um, they both took part in the negotiation process with uh, equal participation, and they now subsequently have both signed the agreement together with the governing party, the ruling party, um, ZANU-PF. After David has spoken, I'm going to hand over to uh, Karen Alexander, who has a specialist in transitional justice issues and is now the manager of Idasa States in Transition Observatory, which has been observing the situation in Zimbabwe and interpreting it, but is also concerned with other transitional states in Africa, and in particular Southern Africa, with the uh, Kingdom of Swaziland, which is entering an electoral period as well. But first, let me hand over to David Coulthard. Thank you very much for joining us. Both David and Karen got off the plane from South Africa this morning um, on the, uh, the, what is really the red-eye flight. <laughs> um, but I think they'll be good for another couple of hours before they leave. <laughs> you're, you're optimistic. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I feel as if you've been brought here under false pretenses. Uh, I think that uh, it's a bit like you're coming to to listen to Beyoncé and you've got Dolly Parton instead, um, for which I apologize. Uh, Tendai Beatty is a, a great friend of mine, a, a wonderful patriot, and um, I know that you would have got, got exceptionally good value from, from him this afternoon, but he's doing valuable work back at home. What I propose to do this afternoon, and this really is off the cuff because um, I've been drafted in at the last moment. Um, I'd like to give you a, a brief thumbnail sketch of the negotiations. Uh, have a look at their roots. Um, touch on the elections this year and then look at uh, the agreement signed on Thursday, the, the 11th of September. I think that we uh, need to go back probably as far as July 2003. You may recall that President Bush travelled to South Africa and, and appointed Thabo Mbeki as his point man. Um, and the reason that discussion took place was because Thabo Mbeki was at pains to tell President Bush that negotiations were in fact in process and that he should be given an opportunity to um, allow those, those negotiations to succeed. And it's quite sobering to think that that was five years ago. Um, but that is, in fact, when uh, negotiations began. Initially, they were much smaller. They were, in essence, between uh, Welshman Mube, who was then the Secretary General of the combined MDC, and Patrick Chinamasa, who was then... Uh, the Minister of Justice. They agreed a new constitution for Zimbabwe, um, which was then, in essence, rejected by Robert Mugabe in 2004 in the run-up to the 2005 uh, parliamentary elections. And <clears throat> with the success that ZANU-PF enjoyed in the 2005 elections, those negotiations uh, pretty much broke down totally, and of course the negotiations were then further complicated by the divisions with, within the, the MDC, which emerged in public in October 2005. And so during 2005-2006, uh, the 
negotiations and Tabo and Becky's policy of quiet diplomacy really fell on hard times. And it took the, uh, the brutal assault on Morgan Tsangarai and people like Ten Diabeti in March 2007 to uh, energize SADC. And that culminated in the meeting in Tanzania, which mandated President Tembeki to act now, not in his personal capacity, but on behalf of, of SADC. And since March 2007, whatever criticism might, one might level against Tabo Mbeki in the past, one has to say that uh, he and his government have been uh, deeply involved in the Zimbabwean crisis since then. And whereas we felt prior to that that, prior to that, that they hadn't pulled out all the stops since March 2007, they, they really have uh, tried their utmost to, to reach an agreement. In the course of 2007, uh, this little uh, party of negotiators comprising six people, two from ZANU, two from the larger MDC faction under M Morgan Tsangi Ryan, two from the smaller under Arthur Mutambara, met. And by the end of 2007, they had agreed on uh, quite a wide range of changes to legislation, uh, the most significant of which was this bulky document here entitled Constitution of Zimbabwe, which was signed all, by all the parties on the 30th of September 2007. Um, it is a reasonably good constitution. It's not everything that I would like, and I'm sure not everything that my colleagues in civil society would like. but. Uh, as academic a document as it is, it, it did mark a, a very important uh, step forward in terms of our constitutional history. But of course, that was just a document signed off by these six negotiators, um, but it has been in the wings since then. At the same time, uh, amendments were made to our most draconian legislation, uh, the Public Order and Security Act, uh, the so-called Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act, which does just the opposite, um, the, the act that, that regulated the media. And those amendments uh, were, were passed through Parliament as part of what everyone thought was going to be a deal in the run-up to the presidential elections, which were scheduled to be held in March 2008. The understanding of the MDC negotiators was that there was going to be a package that would include not just amendments to POSA and AIPA, but would also include the passage of this new constitution. And the understanding was that the election would be uh, conducted uh, in terms of the new constitution. And um, whilst I was not privy to the actual negotiations, our negotiators say that President Mbeki gave an undertaking that that would be the case. The rest, of course, is history. Uh, whilst there were these relatively minor changes to AIPA and POSA and the electoral law, uh, the, the big fish got away in, in terms of the Constitution, and Robert Mugabe announced that he was going to go ahead with not just a presidential election, but a parliamentary election as well, which was not due. It was three years early, uh, which caused a lot of alarm uh, within the opposition. Of course, that caused the negotiations to, to co collapse totally. And the collapse was met uh, with very angry statements from our side, inclu including statements from Welshman Mube, um, very critical of, of President Mbeki. I'm sure that Robert Mugabe's calculation in uh, deciding to defy the agreement reached in those negotiations was based on the fact that the MDC was still in disarray, it was still divided, uh, the general population was completely apathetic, and their intelligence undoubtedly would have told them that if they held a quick election, they would win that election. We had, as I say, had some changes to our legislation which did improve the electoral environment, which allowed journalists to come into the country. And I think that 
um, that relaxation of the environment was a further indication that ZANU PF uh, felt that they could win the election. What they didn't count on uh, was that Simon McConey announced his candidacy. Um, and whilst at the end of the election, we, we all know Simon McConey's candidacy was disastrous and he only secured something like 9% of the vote, what the announcement did was energize the entire electorate. Uh, as I analyze it, um, I believe that Simon McConey made the electorate realize that Zanu PF was vulnerable. The electorate didn't transfer their support to Simon McConey. That support went to Morgan Sangurai. But it undoubtedly, as I say, electrified the entire campaign. Um, and as the campaign went on, Morgan Tsangarai's MDC got stronger and stronger and stronger, this unrelenting momentum uh, built up, and he shocked Zanu PF. I think that he probably won outright. Um, I, I think that he probably got, in the presidential election, over 50%. But the fact of the matter is that even if we accept the Zanu PF, uh, figures, uh, the delayed and I believe massaged figures, the combined opposition defeated ZANU PF and the runoff became inevitable. ZANU reacted much in the same way they reacted to the 2000 referendum. You may recall that in 2000 there was a constitutional commission, a referendum was held in very pleasant, relatively democratic circumstances. ZANU PF lost, was shocked by the loss, and reacted uh, through violence. And we, we got exactly the same reaction. And we haven't seen violence on that scale and with that method and deliberate, um, th that deliberate method since the Kukurohundi. It wasn't on the same scale as the Kukurohundi in the 1980s, um, but as I say, the deliber deliberate nature of it was reminiscent of that period. On the 27th of June, uh, as we all know, Robert Mugabe went ahead with his election as the single candidate, but of course no solution was provided, and that meant that the negotiations would have to commence, especially with the AU and SADC not being prepared to endorse an obviously flawed election. And that culminated in the Memorandum of Understanding being signed on the 21st of July. And the negotiations, which had broken off the previous December, in essence started again on the 27th of July. The reason there's been such rapid progress is because they've built on many of the agreements that were reached last year, including uh, this constitution and a whole range of other documents. And by the 6th of August, uh, the negotiators, comprising the same six people who had been negotiating uh, since April 2007, had agreed on a wide variety of issues, including um, a document uh, committing the country to a new constitutional reform process within an 18-month period, um, committing the country for the first time to a somewhat vague mechanism for a truth commission, um, and importantly, on the 20, 28th of July, committing um, all parties to what was termed a framework for a new government. That framework uh, stated that Robert Mugabe would remain as president, that Morgan Tsangarai would be prime minister. It had a very unwieldy proposal at first, 38 cabinet ministers, three vice presidents, and three deputy prime ministers. And that was all taken to... Um, a meeting of the principles, which was called on the 10th of August. The, the principles meeting comprising Robert Mugabe, Morgan Sangarai, Arthur Mutambara, and the facilitator, President Mbeki, uh, was mandated with trying to agree on the areas that the negotiators themselves couldn't agree. And that those areas were, in essence, how long this transitional, inclusive government would last for, um, what the terms of the constitutional reform process would be, and 
critically important, the structure of the government and in particular uh, what powers the President would have and what powers the Prime Minister would, would have. As I say, the talk started on the 10th in Harare and by the 11th, in essence, agreement had been reached regarding the duration of the transition, uh, agreement had been reached re regarding the constitution and the sticking point was uh, the uh, respective powers of the president and the prime minister. Um, there were a variety of drafts that were presented to the principals and by the evening of Tuesday the 12th of August uh, the negotiations came down to a discussion of in essence two issues. Uh, Morgan Tsangarai had asked that in the document there should be the words that he would be the head of government. And um, secondly, he um, wanted to chair cabinet. Both of these were obviously reasonable uh, requests. Uh, the agreement broke down on the 12th of August. There was a lot of ZANU-PF propaganda that a deal had been reached with the smaller faction, which was false. Um, the, the smaller faction uh, under Arthur Mutambara believed that uh, this was the best deal possible, but has understood from day one of the negotiations that unless there was a tri tripartite agreement, uh, any agreement reached on a bilateral basis would be uh, uh, unsustainable. There was then an impasse. The uh, weekend following the 12th of August, there was a, a meeting in Pretoria of the SADC heads of state. And what came out of that meeting was uh, two key uh, issues. The first was that it appeared as if a majority, an overwhelming majority of SADC heads of state who had seen the deal that was on the table on the 12th of August, believed that it was a reasonable deal. And they put a lot of pressure on Morgan Tsangarai to accept it. And secondly, they gave Robert Mugabe permission uh, to convene Parliament. And there's a lot of speculation about why that happened. And some argue that that was convened so that one could establish once and for all who was going to control the lower house. Just for those of you who haven't followed it closely, let me just take you back a step. On the 29th of March, in the parliamentary elections, uh, in the 210-seat parliament, the MDC under Morgan Sangarai had won 100 seats. The MDC under Arthur Mutambara had uh, won 10 seats. There was one independent, and the balance of 99 uh, were won by Zanu PF. And ZANU-PF had put out a lot of propaganda uh, that because there were 11 members of parliament who did not belong to Morgan Tsangarai's party, that Morgan Tsangarai could not claim to control the lower house. And one of the theories that is out there is that SADC called, uh, or rather allowed Robert Mugabe to call parliament to, to establish very clearly once and for all uh, where the uh, where people's loyalties lay, and that's why the the election for speaker, uh, which followed about ten days later, became a critically important battleground. The election for speaker took place. Uh, the MDC candidate Love Momoyo won that election, and certainly my colleagues in the MDC Tangaraya believe that. Uh, the success in the election of Speaker was uh, the thing that sobered up SADC again and forced Robert Mugabe back to the uh, negotiating table. I don't know whether that is the case, but that's certainly what, what they argue. And so we came back to last week uh, when the meeting of the, of the principals reconvened and that culminated in the agreement which has now emerged following the the signing, or rather the press statement on Thursday, the 11th of September. Just to digress a moment, the 11th of September is a very significant day in Zimbabwean history, especially in opposition history, because uh, it is nine years uh, to the day 
since, or it was on the 11th of September, since the MDC was first formed in, in Harare. And so it, for the MDC, uh, the combined MDC, it was a highly significant day that that agreement should be sealed on uh, that anniversary. Let me turn to, to what has um, now been agreed. The bulk of the document uh, is no surprise to, to th those of us who've been involved in this process because it includes all of these documents which have been signed off on. Let me just hold them up for you. Um, whenever they agreed on a, on a chapter, they would sign off, all six negotiators would sign off. You can see signatures at the bottom. And all of those ag agreements signed off by the 6th of August have been incorporated into, into this agreement. The only change uh, between this agreement and what was on the table on the 12th of April, of course, relates to the powers of the, the President and Prime Minister. Um, this agreement, unlike the 12th of, of August agreement, sets out all the powers of the President, sets out the powers of, of the Prime Minister, whereas the 12th of, of August agreement was rather vague. This is, let me say, quite a cumbersome arrangement. It is clearly uh, the result of negotiations and, and compromise. And the, the basic structure of it is that Robert Mugabe is President, he remains with some executive power, but nothing like the executive power that he has enjoyed today, uh, up until today. Uh, uh, Morgan Sangarai has, exe has executive powers. They are substantial executive powers, but not absolute. Um, in some respects, the powers that Morgan Sangarai had on the 12th of October, uh, of August, have been watered down. Let me give you one example. In clause uh, seven of the 12th of August agreement, uh, let me just read you clause seven. It says, the Prime Minister also advises the President on key appointments the President is required to make under and in terms of the Constitution or any Act of Parliament. Now, in terms of Zimbabwean, uh, the, the Zimbabwean law of interpretation, advise is actually quite a strong word. The, the President has to listen. Uh, consult is a much weaker word. And yet we see in this document that on that key power of appointment of, of judges and ambassadors, the president only now, in terms of this document, has to consult. So you can see in that one area that, that actually there's been a compromise, that uh, Morgan Sangarai does not enjoy the, the powers that he had in the original document. But of course, they balanced out by him having other powers. There's now this Council of Ministers, which he chairs, which in terms of the agreement supervises the role of the cabinet. But it's very unclear from the agreement how those two organizations are, are going to interact. Another issue of great concern, and Chairman, please just yes. cut me off if I'm over time. Another couple of minutes. Another couple of minutes. Another area of great concern um, is that when the agreement was signed on Monday, there was no agreement regarding the allocation of ministries. All the agreement says is that there will be a 31-person cabinet, 15 who will come from ZANU-PF, three from the MDC under Morgan Sangarai, three from the MDC under uh, Arthur Mutambara. But there's nothing in the agreement regarding who gets defense, who gets home affairs, and as you may have read, in the last couple of days, we've started this process of horse trading to work out who is going to get the, the various um, uh, cabinet posts and ministries. I'm out of time. Let me just end uh, by making the, the following comment. This is an imperfect, imperfect agreement, but my own belief is that it's the best deal that we could get in the circumstances. Uh, Robert Mugabe and Zanu PF have demonstrated in the last eight years that they prepared to go to virtually any lengths to remain in power. I think that there was a real fear, certainly in our negotiating team, when we looked at the statements coming from the generals and, and the others, that they were prepared to take Zimbabwe down to the level of Somalia.
it is also a fact that there are hundreds of thousands of Zimbabweans now without food. The humanitarian crisis is um, simply catastrophic. It's hard to describe just how serious it is. And to that extent, we in the opposition had very little choice but to try to reach some agreement uh, so that we could br bring this immense suffering of the Zimbabwean people to an end. That's putting it negatively. Let me put it positively in conclusion. There has been a substantial transfer of power in terms of this agreement. Morgan Tsangarai does exercise substantial power. He will have a majority of members in cabinet. In some respects, of course, it is a poisoned chalice. He has to deal with 15 ZANU-PF uh, ministers who no doubt will go into this in bad faith, who will be doing everything in their power to undermine the arrangement. And that is going to provide an enormous challenge to Morgan Tsangarai as, as Prime Minister. However, ZANU is greatly weakened. It is divided. It has no solution for the economic crisis. If some measure of, of support is forthcoming from the international community, the only person who will get the credit for that is Morgan Sangarai. And if that uh, aid and assistance is channeled wisely and conditionally, uh, then I think that the ministries that Morgan Sangarai controls can be strengthened, that will boost his power and ensure that there is no way that ZANU-PF can ever regain power through this. That's our great fear, that ZANU-PF manages to consolidate uh, it, its position, that we reach a sort of plateau, and uh, they then use that strength to revert to their, their fascist policies of the past. Um, my own view is that if we are positive about this, if we all work together, uh, we can make a success of this. It doesn't bring our woes to an end, but it, it marks, um, as I wrote on, on Friday, the end of the beginning. Thank you. David, thank you very much. And for those who haven't yet been able to obtain either the, uh, the agreement or uh, the speeches by uh, some of the leaders, if you have given us your email address upon registration, we will circulate those documents to you so that you, you have them available to you. And let me now turn to Corin Alexander. Thank you, um, and thanks, David. Uh, I think I have the interesting position of, <laughs> after that very um, detailed and sort of reality-driven speech, I get to ask some of the more academic questions that relate to Zimbabwe. And in some ways, um, again, on your invitations, uh, I was going to look quite a lot more at the comparisons between Kenya and Zimbabwe in this moment of negotiated elite settlements and how they reflect um, on democracy on the continent. And I will still do that briefly. But given the fact that we now have a deal in Zimbabwe, I thought I'd also try and finish off looking at some of the key challenges to this transition and challenges to this agreement that uh, the past eight, the past 28, and the past sort of 108 years of Zimbabwean history present um, to the parties that need to carry that agreement forward. But I think, um, you know, it was early on in this year once uh, the violence had erupted in Kenya and shocked the world, um, and, a, and a deal had been struck in April, which came just sort of days after Zimbabwe started to break down into, into a real problem with the delay in election results, that people began to draw comparisons between the Zimbabwean situation and the Kenyan situation. And as David outlined, a negotiation had been in process since 2003, and so it suddenly became this whole discussion of, was Zimbabwe going to pull a Kenya? Uh, and should Zimbabwe uh, draft a deal like Kenya's deal? But I think I wanted to sort of raise two key questions that I'm not sure I'm going to answer, and I don't think we have answers yet. But the two key questions for me are, what do these elite settlements say about the will of the people, and therefore the true growth of sustainable democracy within Africa? Uh, and what do, what do they allow us to understand about leadership in Africa, which I think 
speaks to some of the questions around the sustainability of democracy on the continent at this point. In a sense, the countries at the moment of comparison did share quite a lot. Um, uh, most principally, they shared these incredibly contested electoral environments. So you had an incumbent uh, in Kenya, not of anywhere near the length of Robert Gabriel Mugabe in Zimbabwe, but an incumbent versus a key opposition leader. Um, in both elections, we saw delayed results. The Kenyan delay was just a couple of days. The Zimbabwean delay was upwards of six weeks. Um, both countries had partisan electoral committees, which shifted the ways in which constituency boundaries had been drawn, the ways in which results were collated and announced. Uh, and both countries saw extraordinary post-election violence. In Zimbabwe, it was a continuum uh, from, in particular, 2000, but from a politics of violence that started in 1980. In Kenya, it was a, an immediate eruption that took a very ethnic character, uh, which was not so much the case in Zimbabwe between the two elections. And you had op opposition leaders in both countries who contested that they had won the elections. Um, in Kenya, as my understanding has it, both parties had cheated, and it just seemed that Kibaki cheated better, so he cheated twice, um, <laughs> which was, you know, fortunate for him. Uh, in Zimbabwe, we only had one side that seemed to cheat, although for the first time in a long time, their cheating was reasonably constrained. However, they do seem to have pinched almost as many of Simba Makoni's votes as they did of Morgan's votes to get the tally in the end to be much closer than it, than it would originally have been. And in both situations, I think David touched on this, you had this issue of an opposition with a slight lead in the, in the House of Assembly. So where there may be contestation around the presidency, I think it became more of a nuanced or complex issue to argue because there wasn't a clear majority um, in Parliament for either grouping. I think uh, Odinga had a four... Uh, person lead within uh, the House of Assembly. Morgan had a one person lead plus the, the 10 MPs that were in the smaller MDC faction. So you have the situation where there's a contest around presidency, but actually the parliamentary vote doesn't give you an obvious answer. Um, and I think particularly on the continent, if you were unsure about how to look at uh, you know, unconstitutional changes of power, stealing of elections, it became more complex for leaders uh, to, to argue because there wasn't this clear and obvious divide in the voting population, although the results were not necessarily a true reflection. And so you have negotiations entered into. Um, and I think where the comparison has been drawn is that you have a leader who steals power uh, and in some ways in both countries incites incredible levels of violence. The Zimbabwean violence was very structured and state organized. Um, or a particular arm of the state organized a lot of the violence. And the reward for that level of violence and the deaths of significant numbers of the population becomes that we will invite you to talks because that's your playing card. Uh, and then in the end, you will get to share power in some sort of government of national unity, coalition government. So you have this remarkable situation where the people obviously don't want a leader, and a leader is clearly acting against the will of his people through violence. Uh, and somehow we're saying that's okay, um, and that, that violence will allow you to, to enter discussions. Uh, and I think that is the real problem. Um, I think it is important for us to note that two countries does not make a trend. <laughs> um, so there's a model that is represented by the Kenyan uh, agreement that is reflected very clearly in the Zimbabwean agreement, although in fact Odinga got less power in the final agreement than Morgan got. Uh, in this agreement, although it does seem that he has, by virtue of his experience in government, having been in opposition state um, positions th uh, throughout uh, his political career, he has been able to strengthen his position. And now some believe stands at more of a 50-50 split and does, in a sense, control uh, more of government than, than he did in the agreement. But I think to bring it back to Zimbabwe, because we now have this deal, there are very key differences that I think make the comparison or make us question the comparison at the outset. And a lot of that was touched on by David in his final words. Um, you have to look at a situation in Zimbabwe where since 2000 the economy has just uh, rocketed downhill. 
And I think as analysts, we've often said, nope, the economy is going to be the breaking point, and it's going to be the breaking point now. And it just never has been. And we've reached these alarming levels of inflation, and I don't think the official statistics capture the inflation. But industrial production in 2001 was lower than it was in 1979. Uh, we have unemployment that's over 85%, and we now have a starving population uh, who are not going to be able to feed themselves. I think also the media restrictions around the Zimbabwean electoral process are a very differing factor to Kenya. There was a lot of coverage in Kenya of the different parties um, where they stood. None of that happened in Zimbabwe. I always tell the story of um, teaching a class for some American students earlier in the year, and one student put up their hand and asked um, what, how Morgan Shangarai stood up against Robert Mugabe in a political debate on television. And I said, no, listen, <laughs> um, our two electoral systems are vastly different, and there are no debates on national television between uh, the two men. Morgan doesn't even get to talk on national television. Um, so there were media restrictions. And I think more significantly, whereas the army in Kenya stayed uh, quite a lot in the background during the violence, the Zimbabwean army and security establishment has taken center stage in this political debate. They have polarized themselves and taken political positions right since 2000, including statements about what kind of leader they consider acceptable. So they have militarized uh, the way in which a government works. Um, but I do think if if we're, we are to look at the comparison, what the two countries raise for us are the challenges in Africa of post-liberation politics and how to move from a post-liberation rhetoric uh, that is a lot about struggle and a lot about war, and we're seeing some of that in South Africa now as well as in Zimbabwe, uh, and early challenges to the idea that the Liberation Party has the mandate to rule simply by virtue of having liberated the nation. And so we haven't moved to a politics of issues. We remain within a politics of liberation and war and freedoms. And of course, a lot of the freedoms have not accompanied um, liberation for the people. So you have a central, centralization of power in the presidency, a centralization of power in a, either a minority or a particular elite, whether it, it takes an ethnic form as it did in Kenya, particularly with the violence, and in Zimbabwe, it has a slightly ethnic nature as well, it can be argued. And opposition is seen as unpatriotic. Uh, Robert Mugabe raised that in his speech on Monday. He said oppositions always think uh, that they should be larger than they are and they should have more importance than they do. Uh, and so oppositions are painted as inherently wrong. Uh, and we have the situation where African leaders have subscribed to the winner-takes-all uh, realm of politics, and they once they have the power of the state, having power is so sweet that they use the state to ensure that they never lose power. So we have a manipulation both of the political situation and of the people, and a manipulation of the state as a tool by which to maintain power. And that state can be, can be quite scary, as Zimbabweans have realized, in the ways in which it meets out uh, punishment for not supporting the powerful. And I think we then have to look at two quite critical questions. The first is, what do Kenya and Zimbabwe suggest to us about the electoral systems that have been chosen in Africa, in, in a, a number of countries in Africa, uh, this first-past-the-post, winner-takes-all system? How has that impacted on politics in Africa, where you have nations that are comprised often of a wide variety of ethnic groups, significant minorities uh, in a lot of African nations, and does a winner-take-all system allow for true representation of the people? Where, do the, where does the will of the people get lost in a first-past-the-post system? Uh, and what, what is this exclusionism that comes with taking state power? What is the legacy that it prescribes for the people of Africa? And I think sort of somewhat an answer to that, and as the second question, you need to look at one of the key challenges for both of these transitional governments or coalition governments, and that is the question of institutional reform. And I think there's quite a key worry for uh, a lot of us with the Zimbabwean agreement in that it is not very specific about institutional reform. How is judicial reform going to happen? How is reform of the security sector going to happen? And both of those get very short shrift in the agreement and actually will be central to, to the success of this agreement or its failure. And I mean, in Zimbabwe in particular, 
uh, I think there are four challenges to transition and they all relate to institutional reform. Um, the first one, as Paul mentioned, I, I have a thing about transitional justice, is discourses of exclusion. And it hasn't just been in politics. Uh, there's been a long history of Robert Mugabe and ZANU PF constructing citizens out of the nation. So it's not just about whether you're a liberation war hero, it's about whether you were born in Zimbabwe, do you have the right to be a citizen, do you have the right to vote. So a large majority of us Zimbabweans have been disenfranchised uh, since 2002 uh, because they have been trying to constru construct citizens out of the nation. Um, and there's these who are we, who are they discourses that start in the mid-1980s with the massacre of the Ndebele people in the south of the nation. Um, and that's going to bring significant challenges, I think, even to the new government. We've seen strains of ethnicity coming through. Um, I don't believe it was the principal reason for the MDC split at all in 2005, but it was drafted as such. And there are discourses that paint pictures of ethnic division in Zimbabwe that are not helpful. Um, the other challenge uh, that we're going to face is what many analysts have called rule by law in Zimbabwe as opposed to the rule of law. And there are significant changes that are going to need to happen. Um, and obviously they're covered in a, an 18-month constitutional reform process. But during that time, how do things like access to information and protection of privacy or the restrictions on freedom of movement and association operate? Um, the third is this question of violence as governance. Uh, and I think this is one area where Zimbabwe may differ strongly from Kenya, but the nation, I think, has never been off a war footing since 1980, and Mugabe has used this joint operational command that has been running the country, um, and it's a creation of Ian Smith's from Rhodesia that has been carried forward through the nation. And so you have, you may not see them as much in your press, but we've had several operations the nation has been run through operations. Uh, Operation Marumba China, which was um, uh, clear out the dirt or the rubbish, or there is a stronger word uh, that can be used. Uh, we had uh, the operation just after the election, checking how you voted. We had an operation take down your satellite dishes so that people were not able to see the news. The nation has been run in this military style, and reform of the security sector will be, I think, the front of the struggle in Zimbabwe outside of the economy over the next uh, two to five year period. I do also think that there have been some interesting regional and international dynamics um, that have come into play and will continue through the transition. One is, um, uh, uh, or with all due respect, the weakness, I think, in some respects, because of an isolationism that has been applied to them of the opposition. Uh, and we don't necessarily have the strongest group of MPs who are now uh, sitting in the House of Assembly. And so th there's going to need to be a, a huge strengthening of capacity and a return of capacity from the diaspora um, into the country. We are going to face the question of land reform, which I think remains a question in Kenya, remains a question in South Africa, and how that is dealt with. And Mugabe has been very clever in his construction uh, of the issue of land reform and anti-imperialism throughout the continent. It's why he still gets a standing ovation in Swaziland. Um, and in South Africa when, when he visits. Land reform is going to have to be dealt with appropriately in Zimbabwe and actually will form one of the, the early issues that we have to tackle because the agriculture, agricultural sector will, I think, be an engine for economic regrowth in the, in the early part of our reconstruction. And then there is the question of funds, and there are two ways to look at funds um, and the money that is you know, publicly sitting there from the American side, from the EU side, from the African Development Bank. Um, and in some ways, I think Morgan has been seen as the man with the swipe card or the ATM card for the nation. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of caution around how that money comes in. And I, I do believe I advocate for it quite clearly that it need, there needs to be a lot of caution about how and when the money comes in. But does that mean that he's in a strong position if it doesn't come in? Does it weaken him if it doesn't, you know, what were uh, a diplomat, in fact, asked more than spokesperson yesterday, what were the promises made by the MDC about money that would flow? And Morgan spokesperson said none, but I think there is an expectation on the side of ZANU PF. And so that, that may be an area of instability that grows in Zimbabwe, and I think it may be less so in Kenya.
Um, so I think in a sense the deal raises more questions than it does answers. And I think in some ways there are questions of stability that are, that are going to echo between Zimbabwe uh, and Kenya. We're about to, I think, have the great fight of who is number two. Is it one of the two vice presidents? Is it Morgan Shangarai? And I know that's been an issue in Kenya. Who gets to sit on the left-hand side of the president? Who gets to introduce the president? So we'll have some fun, uh, sort of slightly less serious squabbles about uh, status. But instability is, is going to characterize the next three to six months, I think. Um, and I think probably the saddest thing about that is that it may not get to deal with the will of the people for 18 months. The people in Zimbabwe are still waiting, and they've been waiting a long time, and they're hungry, uh, and they're looking forward to change and to be able to pay their kids' school fees and to being a able to go to a hospital and get more than an aspirin. Uh, and I think that's going to be the biggest challenge is dealing with those expectations of the people uh, as this deal moves forward uh, step by step. Uh, and I think I will leave it there with more questions <laughs> than answers. <laughs>
is on the implications of uh, a new constitution that must come uh, into being, uh, I think, 18 months after this deal. Um, uh, what are the implications of that? Are we then going to have a whole you know, new election? Uh, are we going to disband what is there? Or the constitution will come in 18 months, but this government is going to be there for five years? Um, you know, I, can we get some clarity on that? And then the second issue is that um, the text of the agreement uh, also talks about the irreversibility of uh, the land reform program. Um, and being a Zimbabwean myself, who did not benefit from the land reform program and who believes that, you know, deserves uh, some piece of land somewhere, um, and also knowing very well how central the, uh, like, reorganization uh, in the agricultural sector is going to be if, uh, you know, we are going to turn around the economy. Uh, what really does that mean? And was it clear to the MDC parties what that means? And, you know, what's really going to, to, to happen in that? Okay. Thank you. I'm behind you. Uh, Gregory Simpkins from the Leon Sullivan Foundation. I have a question for each of our panelists. The first for, for David is, um, excuse me, Senator David, <laughs> is um, the Western, the, the Europeans, the Americans are saying they're taking a, a wait and see attitude about how and when to disperse funding. Uh, what would you, as a member of the opposition, suggest would be concrete, solid, measurable benchmarks to be used to determine whether funding should, should start? And uh, for Ms. Alexander, as you're looking at Kenya and, and Zimbabwe, the situations there, how would you rate the performance of the African Union and the United Nations in dealing with both situations, the elections, the violence, and, and the negotiations? Thank you very much. Why don't we pause briefly and, and uh, give time to just respond to those questions? And then we'll, we'll take the second round, starting with you, sir. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm just looking for my notes on the, on the land. What I'd like to do is uh, address Frank's question and, and Reed's uh, second question together, because they both touched on, on land. <clears throat> the document on land is very much a compromised document, and my, my personal view is that it's highly unsatisfactory. It, it proposes that... Um, a non-partisan land audit be done, but it gives uh, the entire tenure of the seventh parliament for that to happen in. So in other words, uh, it, it gives a period of five years for this to take place, and quite frankly, we don't uh, have that time. Uh, we don't have the luxury of that time. Secondly, the land audit is solely set up for the purpose, I, and I quote, the purpose of establishing accountability and eliminating multiple farm ownerships. And then tied into that, of course, is the provision that you've mentioned, Reeds, about the irreversibility um, and uh, the, the fact that the UK has to pay compensation for land acquired from former, from former land owners for resettlement. In other words, there's no recognition of of any rights in any existing rights uh, in, in this document. So um, coming to, so it, it's unsatisfactory uh, in its present form, but if there was any sticking point in the negotiations, it was around land. If there was any issue that Zanu was not going to yield on, it, it was a, around this issue. and. The calculation made by the negotiators was that to move the process ahead, we simply had to, to agree to that. We, we had no options. But of course, coming to Frank's uh, first question now, um, Zimbabwe does need to get agriculture underway. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that we are not going to be able to feed the nation until we get commercial agriculture functioning again. And to do that, whilst no one wants to go back to the 2000, no one in their right mind uh, believes that the land holdings in 2000 were equitable or sustainable. But there has to be some 
uh, reversion, if not total, to, to get uh, commercial farmers back on. And so it's very difficult to conceive how, especially with this season in mind, we are ever going to get a, a sufficient number of farmers on, on the ground. And here we are in mid-September. Uh, there's hardly any grain in the country. There's no seed. Um, and this coming agricultural season, due to start in October, looks as though it's going to be even more disastrous than, than the previous season, which was catastrophic. Um, so un unfortunately, the, the political reality and the agricultural economic reality is that the agreement is not going to address it this season. One, one hopes that sanity may yet prevail uh, prior to the, the, the planting of the winter wheat crop next year and that we may, by the summer crop of 2009, uh, have conducted an audit and, and got uh, sanity to prevail. Regarding your peace d dividend, dependent on foreign assistance, yes. Uh, if I understand your question, it's um, the point that I made, uh, I made earlier on about Morgan Sangarai, as flawed as this agreement is, Morgan Sangarai is going to be the only person who gets any benefit from that. And so if there is foreign assistance um, that, that comes in, because we're coming off such a, a very low um, benchmark, any improvement uh, in the lives of people, are get, that, that, that improvement will be credited to, to Morgan Sanger Rice. So he can reap a considerable peace dividend, which will not only be to his benefit, but I think to the benefit of, of the entire nation, but also those committed to democratic change. It will, I think, encourage that process. Um, turning briefly to, to Reed's first question about the implications of a new constitution. In terms of this document, it has to culminate <coughs> uh, within an 18-month period in a referendum. Uh, the, the process states that civil society has to be uh, included in the constitutional debate. A parliamentary committee is set up which will include representatives of civil society. And as I say, it will culminate <coughs> in a referendum so that the people themselves have, have their say. Uh, let me touch on one thing. I spoke about the fact that the negotiators couldn't reach agreement regarding the duration mm -hmm. of this administration. And the compromise that was reached was that the only time frame that is agreed to is the time frame for the promulgation of the new constitution. It being agreed in that context that when the new constitution is debated and, and finally passed by parliament, the constitution, the new constitution, will include a provision regarding when the first election in terms of that constitution is to be held. The opposition wants an election sooner rather than later. Zani PF wants this entire term of five years to, to, to stay. So in essence, that issue has been uh, packed but we, we do have some room to manoeuvre. Maneuver. Turning to Greg, um, the EU and US wait and see attitude, concrete benchmarks to be used. Well, <coughs> the one thing I'd say at, at the outset, and this doesn't just apply to Zani PF, it applies to us all in, in the MDC, that the West has to learn the lesson of 1980 and the 1980s where Robert Mugabe was given incredible latitude, where aid flooded in, where kukuruhundi, where genocide, where crimes of, against humanity were simply ignored, and aid was poured in and plaudits were given. Uh, that must not happen again. When we talk about benchmarks, those benchmarks have to be applied, not just to Zanu PF, but to Morgan Tsangarai, to David Coltart, to Arthur Mutambara, and everyone who presently purports to, to have adopted a, a democratic agenda. Um, I think that uh, bearing that general statement in mind, uh, I'm not saying that the, the West should drip feed a, assistance in because at, in, in the short term at least, we have this 
catastrophic humanitarian crisis which is going to need vast resources poured in. But once the humanitarian crisis has been addressed and once the economy has been stabilized, I think that uh, further aid must be dependent on certain benchmarks. Uh, the obvious benchmark is the promulgation of a new democratic constitution. Tied into that needs to be the terms of that constitution. Uh, for example, let's go back to the land issue. Is this constitution going to have the, the present fuzzy clauses, the, the fuzzy clauses on land that are in, in this draft? Um, if those clauses are included, well, I'm not sure that, that, that aid should continue in, in the same volumes. Um, if, however, basic rights are, are respected, uh, title is respected, if the compensation issue is, is addressed fairly, um, then obviously that, that can un unleash further funding in future. I, I don't have enough time, but uh, in essence what I'm saying is that the, the, the benchmarks must be li linked not just to a new constitution, but to building institutions which are going to d guarantee democracy and freedom in, in future. That was never done in the 1980s and 1990s. We need to learn that lesson. Um, thanks. I will just deal with the one question from Gregory. And I, I do have to openly confess that I didn't follow the, the role of the AU and the UN in Kenya as closely as I have evidently followed the situation in Zimbabwe. But I do think, well, the, the two situ situations raise such in interesting questions because Kenya's violence erupted in a moment. Um, and for all of those geopolitical reasons and other reasons, a flash of violence, at the mention of the word, words genocide in Rwanda, uh, and the world seemed to, to rally around Kenya um, quite clearly. And there was a lot of, um, I don't think always constructive, but there was a lot of support um, from all sorts of international organizations to help with mediation, to provide technical support, um, to get in there and, and work on the situation. Uh, and obviously with Kofi Annan stepping in, you, it was a very high profile event um, or process that happened. And I think the Zimbabwean situation is so much different. And there are often times when people ask, why so much attention on Zimbabwe? You know, it isn't Somalia and it isn't the Sudan. But, you know, the, the violence and the death has been ongoing uh, for at least eight years, if not 20 years, um, under the current, uh, well, not no longer the current regime and no longer the current ruling party. Um, so uh, there is, there is that, that differentiation of, of how it came into being. I do think the AU was much quicker um, to react to Kenya. You know, it, only after the violence between the March and the June elections this year did you see African leaders starting to take different stances on Zimbabwe. It was really quite interesting, and it did, I think, help. Was was a remarkable moment in March when Morgan, even if ZANU-PF didn't allow him his constitutional majority, did did allow for the fact that he had won that election. But the violence that resulted from that, and I think in particular the forms of torture that were used, um, which were quite brutal and new, certainly shifted the way in which African countries were looking at Zimbabwe and, Af and the ways in which African leaders spoke out on Zimbabwe. So um, you had Kikwete speaking out, you had Botswana speaking out, you had Mwanawasa um, taking an incredibly strong stance uh, on the Zimbabwean situation, and that did change how the continent was looking at it. I do think you need to, we need to remember often that you were dealing with so, some quite new leadership in Kenya, although both Kibaki and Odinga have been in politics for a long time, and Robert Gabriel Mugabe, who's one of the fathers uh, of African nationalism and one of the last sort of um, men of his time who was, who was at that stage still an incumbent president, and I suppose is, still is. Um, I think it's unfortunate because uh, we have just taken on looking at the AU Charter on Elections, Good Governance and Democracy, which is a remarkably strong document to have come out uh, of the African Union and actually is incredibly progressive. And we're going to start benchmarking our analysis of African countries and, and democratization on the continent on the clauses of that charter because it's an African document. 
Uh, and it does seem odd that the, the AU in particular is, is, is not great at following its own, <laughs> um, its own clauses. You know, I think there was the example of Mauritius, where someone had genuinely won an election. Uh, the Supreme Court found that he had won it and the election had been stolen, and the AU said they, they thought it was an unconstitutional takeover of power. So how it is implemented is always a separate question. Um, and I do think Sadak, and in particular Thabo and Becky, did not play a, a positive role always in the situation on Zimbabwe. I think Mbeki was actually an, uh, a partisan mediator. And for him and for a lot of the SADC leadership, different from the AU necessarily, uh, they wanted ZANU-PF to remain in some form or another. And they were pushing for that throughout the negotiation process. And they've never really respected the MDC. I think that does reflect some of um, South African politics because the MDC represents a trade union movement. I mean, you know, that, ha that has come forward and perhaps the strongest opposition in South Africa would only ever come if we saw the trade unions break away from the tripartite alliance. But for some reason, Africa has never credited Morgan Shanghai or the MDCs as a whole with being a genuine opposition. Uh, for some reason, Africa bought Mugabe's discourse and saw them as agents of the West. And I'm not going to say that they didn't get funding. You know, obviously there are issues there, but they were actually speaking the will of the people, and for some reason Africa never rallied to support them. Um, and I think it is a great shame for our continent that it only started to happen so recently. But I do think we need to be wary of the ways in which the leadership of, of our continent sort of clubs together a little, uh, and incumbent leadership tends to regard opposition as a negative not as a positive, not as a sign of democracy, but as a threat to them. And so I think we have a way to go in um, how African leaders support one another and step outside of the club to make statements um, and are not isolated for that because Nelson Mandela felt some of that isolation. Thabo and Becky felt some of that isolation. So there is still a shift that needs to happen. But if we can use the documents that we have in SADC and in the AU, which are strong, um, and get the people of Africa as concerned about those documents uh, as the leaders who maybe just signed them all off because King Mswati signs every document, um, regardless of what might be happening in Swaziland. But if we can mobilize the people around those African documents, then I think we could strengthen um, the ways in which the AU and the SADC uh, work. Um, a small other point is I think there is a worry that in terms of verification mechanisms or, or benchmarks, the MDC really felt that despite the fact that Ping was involved um, uh, and Haile Menkerios were involved, they never actually sat in on negotiations as I understand it. They didn't uh, observe the process. There does seem to be some agreement that I think Ping will come back in on a weekly basis for several months, but it's very unclear how those other parties to the, the Zimbabwean SADC negotiation will be involved in monitoring it. And I think as much as we need buy-in, I think Kenya has stronger systems. Oh, doesn't it? Yeah. Both, both parties, therefore, or both agreements, lack the support of others to ensure that they happen. And I think that unnerves both, uh, well, now I'll conclude the people of Kenya, but it certainly unnerves the people of Zimbabwe and will probably come to unnerve the people of Kenya that there isn't a stronger buy-in from the people who brought the mediation into being to, s to ensure that it is implemented. Okay. I'm going to take the next sort of five, so that will start in with yourself, and then there were three here, and then yourself at the back. And, but before uh, we take the comments from the floor, at that point I'm going to let my Nakai in so that he can say a word about Kenya. So we'll start with you, sir. And then there are these three questions in this. Uh, if the Mike can go to the man with the blue shirt about halfway down. And then there's yourself, and then I think you had some colleagues around you. I think you, you, you may be number five, but we'll see. And we'll take that group, and then my Nakai will come in. So. Uh, thank you. My name's Noah Bopp. I'm with the School for Ethics and Global Leadership, which is a high school program here in DC. I wanted to ask about the impact of the court case that's now in front of the SADC tribunal involving the 77 white farmers. What is the power of that tribunal and what are the best and worst case uh, outcomes of that, uh, of those proceedings? Thank you. And yourself, sir? Thank you. 
Uh, Lawrence Freeman from Executive Intelligence Review Magazine, African Desk. I'd just like to ask two questions on the relationship of sovereignty of Zimbabwe and the international players, and particularly uh, former colonial master Great Britain. One is it seems to be what you're saying when I read in the media is that uh, the British and the Americans have dangled these billions of dollars outside of Zimbabwe, and the only way they get them is if it goes through Morgan Shangarai. Uh, that seems to be an undue influence of former powers on a sovereign country to determine how the money gets dispersed and only gets really what I read in the media is if he doesn't have substantial powers, this money may not come into Zimbabwe. So that I disagree with. I want to know what you thought because that's outside interference on the sovereignty of a country. The second point is that it is known, it's not a perception, that the MDC in Shanghai were created or supported by the Zimbabwe Trust democracy out of Great Britain. George Soros's Open Society Institute have been very involved, the National Endowment for Democracy, very involved in organizing for regime change over many years. So now you have someone in the government from the NDC who is not just perceived, he was acting under the influence of these forces. How does that not undermine the sovereignty of Zimbabwe? Thanks very much. Now, there were two other hands here, and yes, yourself, and then I think this gentleman here. And uh, Conrad Huber from USAID. I just wanted to uh, push the question of benchmarks, maybe ask it slightly differently, and that would be sort of litmus tests. If we were looking uh, uh, out over the next few weeks or even two to three months, what would be the signal events that would suggest that this deal is actually holding or, or not? And if I could ask a specific question about the, the Joint Operations Command. The Karen mentioned is the, the accord, as far as I can tell, is actually silent on what happens to the to the jock. Um, is that an obvious litmus test? And you could expand on that. Thank you, the gentleman in the front. Expanding of that is what I mean. Uh, in the, with the purple tie. Yeah, um, my name is Wilson Awe, uh, a research intern with the African Program at uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my question is, um, considering the role of uh, the civil society during the struggles in uh, Kenya and Zimbabwe, and uh, realizing that uh, the civil society has not really been part of the uh, peace process and negotiations and power sharing in these two uh, cases, uh, what do you think is the uh, implication of this for uh, the future of democracy? in the continent of Africa. Thank you. And then we'll take one last one at the back there, gentleman with the beard. Thank you. I'm Tony Holmes from the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. I'd like to ask David to project out into the future a little bit. One of the more interesting points of Kenya-Zimbabwe comparison that Karen did not mention is the futility of a fractured political opposition in unseating well-entrenched presidents. Uh, in Kenya, this was particularly true in the 1990s, the two time there, times there were presidential elections and Daniel Arap Moy was able to remain in power because of the tribalized and fractured opposition. In, our, in November of last year, Morgan Changarai came to New York and I asked him the same question. Why has the MDC splintered, and what are the implications of that? And his response was, basically, this is South Africa's doing. Tabo and Becky engineered this. South, the South African government has financed the Mutambara faction, and when the election comes, you will see, he predicted, that they represent less than 10% of the opposition in Zimbabwe. Well, now that the votes have been counted, he was quite prescient. He knew his constituency, and his faction got 10 times the number of votes of the Mutambara faction. Now, given ZANU-PF's and Mugabe's already quite apparent efforts to use the Mutambara vote and its existence as a lever to perpetuate his own rule and to say that, in fact, Changarai really has only the same number of parliamentary seats or the same number of supporters that we have. 
how do you see in this context the future of the two factions and what would you predict will happen? Thank you. And now that's an appropriate time, I think, to, to invite my Nikai to introduce himself. And I think he wants to say a word about the Kenya situation in relation to the Zimbabwean one. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Maina Kiai. <coughs> and let me say it again, so Kiai, um, <laughs> because I keep getting funny ways anyway. Um, <laughs> just a little bit on, on, on what, has, what has been said. And, and because, you know, I, as you said, I'm, I am from Kenya. And in fact, we were involved very much in, in the process of transition and the peace talks that were going on. There are a number of things, though, that, that, that are important to us, and even though we were not part of the, the, the principal players, the deal that was signed in Kenya was, to a very large extent, what we put forward to the negotiators, very, very much, to a large extent. It doesn't actually give, it, there were some words in the, in the agreement that make the Prime Minister quite powerful, because he has the power to, to uh, supervise and coordinate all government activities. That's a very powerful line. And, and then it was put in the Constitution, which, which says that that agreement overrides every other, if there's a conflict between, between anything, it overrides every other part of the Constitution. Now, the, the difficulty for, for Kenya has been in the implementation, and partly because uh, Mr. Odinga, for whatever reason, hasn't been able to assert himself within the bureaucracy the way you'd expect. But I think one question I want to ask you both in terms of Zimbabwe is what, looking at now three or four months down the, the line for Kenya, is the quality of the people you'll have in the coalition. Uh, for us, there's no difference between Kibaki's people and Odinga's people. These are all thieves and conmen and corrupt people. There's no, really not, not much of a difference. And, and one of the weaknesses for us as well was that, was that we, we, we had hoped to put, have a transitional limit. This government should have had a limit. We asked for two years, and that was going on, but apparently Kibaki refused. Now, it's going to last five years, and in Kenya, our leadership will not resign. They will not postpone. They, they, will, they may pass a constitution, but it will take effect after 2012 because being a member of parliament in Kenya or being a minister is extremely lucrative. You just can't let go. You might as well serve the few, that, 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 that time. So the quality of the coalition members makes a difference. I'm wondering whether how you all plan to do it within your faction in, of MDC, uh, Mr. Kokolta, how you intend to, to put that in and how you, how, you know, because we end up with a government of about 100 people in Kenya, which, which is un, un, unruly. And, and I think that um, the question was asked about the AU. The AU was extremely involved in Kenya. Kofi Annan actually was a representative of the then chairperson of, of AU, uh, although his whole staff was mostly UN. Um, Grasso Mandel, uh, Man, uh, Michel, <laughs> came, came in there as part of the AU uh, African peer review mechanism. Benjamin Kappa came as the eminent persons within the AU. So there's a lot of just AU uh, involvement. Of course, the UN played a huge role behind the scenes, providing sectarial services and support and other things. So it actually was a very, very important part of it. And, and, and maybe the thing, the thing for, for, for me is, is that what Kenya and Zimbabwe show is really the collapse of the state. That the, the way the state was created at independence for Kenya 63, for Zimbabwe 1980, has reached its timeline. It's, it's, it's ended. It can't sustain itself anymore, whether the violence is coming from the state or from, or from individuals. But it's, it's, it's just ortrified and decayed. And maybe the question we need to be asking ourselves and whether when looking at these constitutional approaches is whether we can create new states and new forms of nations that, that make sense to the people. Because as you, as you rightfully say, these are elite deals, and, and they're made for the elite. And in fact, the reason why they reached agreement in Kenya was that there was pressure on both sides, get a deal, we want to be ministers, you know? We want to be ministers, get a deal, it doesn't matter. And actually, after that was done, everything else has collapsed, and it's not moving. So we are, it's civil society pushing, want a new constitution, what happened to this, what happened to the Truth Commission, and all those things. And, and although I think there's not the right time to have a Truth Commission, just because the tensions are quite high, uh, there is, there is, there's, a, there's, a, 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 there's a tiredness, if you wish, from the political class to move on. They got what they wanted, which was be in government, make some money, prepare for the next election, and then see, and see where it goes. So I think that is, is one of the things that, 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 I, that I see, and I'm wondering whether, how you're looking at it in terms of Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we, we'll take, uh, again, your responses. Maybe, Karen, you'd like to start. And then, uh, um, I, I'm actually going to leave the SADC Tribunal and Farmers to David um, because I don't know as much about the intricacies of, of the case that is before the tribunal at the moment. Um, 
Lawrence, you ask <laughs> a very interesting question about sovereignty in Zimbabwe. Um, and I think it is a question that I have asked myself. Uh, and I remember listening to uh, a political analyst from the States talk about party funding just a week ago and how it must be individually raised. And then if you're going to take on state funding, there's a cap and you can't exceed it. And I'm not sure of the legal implications of party funding within Zimbabwe, but I think actually what David raised about the issue of not repeating the mistake of the 1980s possibly deals with it. I think we're going to have to live with um, the amount of funding that has come, particularly through Morgan Changa Eyes MDC, I think, uh, from in international groupings. And I think in some ways they've been lucky that it hasn't been picked up as much by the press. And certainly Mugabe has picked it up in his small way, uh, although he's very loud in that small way, as to um, them being agents of the West. I don't believe that. I do believe they have needed the support and they certainly weren't going to get it from the state. Uh, and I do believe that they, they represent the will of the people t to some degree or another. So I think it's quite a difficult one for Zimbabweans. Uh, it's obviously a question we're going to have to deal with and I think should maybe um, be form part of, if we had the space, a commission on uh, economic crimes and crimes of greed. That sounds bad, but I think that there, there are issues of where that funding has gone. Um, and if we're going to be true to ourselves as a nation, we're going to have to ask them of the MDC as much as we've asked them of ZANU-PF. Um, so I think we're going to need to look at it. I'm not sure what the best time is going to be to look at, to look at it. Um, I believe there was a movement in the Zimbabwean people for more democratization. So I know that you know there's been a, American rhetoric and British rhetoric on regime change and sponsoring regime change. Um, I don't believe they started <laughs> the push for regime change. So I think you'd need to nuance your understanding of the, of the ways in which it has happened to understand that the people of Zimbabwe were calling for change and were organizing themselves for change. And people perhaps saw an opportunity to support that change. Um, and actually, I think in some ways, Morgan's going to have a harder time dealing with the fact that actually a lot of his original financial support and and genuine support came from the white farmers in Zimbabwe and how he deals with that constituency. Not that I think that that was wrong. That was, it was responding to a moment. But there are going to be issues that they, they, they have to face. Um, and I think there are going to be issues about how he is advised going forward. He's, there are, you know, people talk about Morgan being dizzy with advice and being as good as the last person he spoke to. Um, and I, I don't think that's always fair, but I think it does suggest the extent to which he has been advised externally and perhaps does not carry within his grouping the relevant capacity to, to take the nation forward and, and is going to need technical support. And I think that could come from Zimbabweans. There are enough Zimbabweans uh, in the diaspora and roundabout who could do that. So it doesn't have to be foreigners. But I, I think you raise a complicated question and it's one that may never get dealt with. Uh, leadership in Africa is not always good at self-reflection uh, and I'm not sure given the MDC split in 2005 Morgan is very good at self-reflection uh, either you know and it's a fragile time and he needs to be as strong as he can be at this point but I, I think you raise a difficult question for the nation of Zimbabwe um, Conrad you asked about Jock and I think it's obviously going to be the key question in the shift in Zimbabwe, and I think they are going to work quite hard, or certainly the Hawks will work quite hard to destabilize this rather fragile coalition. But they have, there, there has been a new National Security Council created that, as I understand it, Morgan Changarai and Robert Gabriel Mugabe jointly chair. No, but Changarai can advise. He sits on the, on, on the board of that. So that, that is going to be a problem, uh, and I think we are, civil society to come to that question is going to need to start raising and has raised in a, in a recent statement some issues of lustration and sunset clauses and, and, and trying to shift those people out of power. But the problem in a transition is always that you'd rather cling on for as many years as you get, whether it's 18 months, two years or five years, and get what you can because you know you're probably on your way out. But I think Jock remains an outlier for me. Um, I do not think they would stage a coup, actually, at this stage, and I, I never really have thought that they would, other than the silent coup they staged after March 29th. 
but they remain an outlier and they are going to need to be dealt with before the situation um, can be considered truly stable. Uh, role of civil society. Yeah, it, it's, it's been interesting. They weren't part of the negotiations, and in Zimbabwe, certainly they felt initially that they were okay for the political parties to deal with a political settlement, but if it started coming to issues of a constitution, for example, or transitional justice, then they felt they should be at the table. And for the first time, actually, I think in ages, at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, you saw quite a considerable break between civil society and the MDC, particularly Morgan Shangarai's section of the MDC, because they felt they were not being consulted. You know, the National Constitutional Assembly, out of which, in some senses, the MDC was also born, um, feels very strongly about a people-driven constitution and have been pushing that issue for a long, long time, but share a membership almost directly with the MDC. Um, and I, I think Zimbabwean civil society has suffered a little bit from being quite fractured. Um, the crisis has been a good time for some people to make quite a lot of money uh, being civil society, and some groups have taken stronger positions and other groups have faded away. We've also had a constant changeover. So we had a very strong group of civil society leaders at the birth of the NCA, the birth of the MDC, the birth of Crisis Coalition, who then moved on quite quickly. Um, and that shift in leadership has, has been interesting. But also you lost a lot of strong civil society leaders into the MDC, which I think is a, is a normal process in the formation of an opposition political party in a situation like Zimbabwe's. But they do need to start standing up and demanding certain things f from the state, I think. And I think in Kenya they've done that a little bit. There is, um, I think they're called the All Stakeholder Task Force, and they're raising strong issues. They've prevented two sets of legislation going through in Kenya. They're raising strong issues on corruption and transitional justice. So the fact that there's a deal doesn't prevent civil society from stepping forward to stake its claim. Um, Tony, you do, you do raise a really interesting question, and I think one of the greatest weaknesses of the MDC has been that split that happened in 2005. Um, from what I understand of the split, it was a split on democratic principle. Uh, and I think one shouldn't necessarily take Morgan's pr prediction about Mutambara's MDC on face value. I think the most important way to see the March 29th elections is as a referendum on Robert Gabriel Mugabe. And the nation of Zimbabwe voted no for Mugabe. Uh, and Morgan Shangarai is, is really the best man standing at this point, and he has showed exemplary courage over the last eight years, and he, I think the people of Zimbabwe were acknowledging that, but I don't necessarily think they were saying, you're absolutely the number one best man for the job. Uh, and I think in 2013 you will see interesting things. They've faded a bit, but I think some of McConey's grouping may do some really interesting things over the next five years. They've recognized that they got 8%, and that makes them nothing but sore losers, if they say much now. Um, and so, as I understand it, they're looking at 2013. They're going to build a party. They're going to come forward. And hopefully, while it has its negatives, hopefully the split in the opposition brings us to a point where we have some form of more multi-party politics in Zimbabwe. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Uh, I think it would actually be a strength for the nation. Um, and I do believe there's a lot of strength uh, and principle in Mutambara's grouping as well. So it, it may just be a question of time. Uh, and I don't think, I think all Zimbabweans knew they couldn't sacrifice this election. Um, well, they couldn't sacrifice the moment to get rid of uh, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Okay. Bef uh, let me just see whether there are any uh, remaining questions in the room. I see two. Um, I, I'm going to just, uh, we're going to just take those two now b because we are running past three. Yourself uh, uh, and then the person behind you and then David will get uh, the last word and we'll wrap up. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> okay, you, you, um, Stole the last word. <laughs> you, the last word may have been stolen, but uh, the, um, <laughs> We, we've slipped past three o'clock, and I think some people had an expectation to close at three. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lawrence. I'm from DAI. I just wanted to ask about um, Senator Coulthard about the 
good governance, uh, the institutions that he thought would need to be strengthened. And it, it seems that, that there's been a lot of talk in the last eight years about the evisceration of the Zimbabwean economy, but the institutions of governance from top to bottom have also been eviscerated. And I'd be interested in hearing what you think are the priorities or where are the entry points or what institutions are, are ripest uh, for building capacity, for for being strengthened to build back up the governance capacity that was in Zimbabwe and that in is is now so greatly diminished, uh, as well as the you know where is there a room to tackle the corruption that has just uh, <laughs> diminished every aspect of Zimbabwe as I've seen it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the person behind you. My name is David Schiffer. I'm from the Eurasia Group. I was just wondering um, about South Africa and uh, uh, Zuma's and, and Becky's, um, you know, current, uh, you know, weakened state uh, leading up to the next election and perhaps uh, Zuma, most likely Zuma's uh, takeover, and the implication of that with the uh, strengthening of Kosatu and, and the left in, uh, in the NC and its implications on on Zimbabwe and the uh, and the peace. Uh, Peace uh, negotiations and the peace um, uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, how how that would how that would affect it? Okay, and those will be the last two. I'm sorry. Um, we uh, we'll just take uh, David on that, and then I'll make a concluding comment. Uh, do I have your permission to go back to some of the previous questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Noel is still here. Yes. Noel, the SADC case. Um, the, the SADAC Tribunal is a very new uh, institution uh, set up in terms of the SADAC protocol. It has limited powers. Um, its principal power is to determine whether a member state is in compliance with the SADAC protocol, and if it isn't, it has the power to make a recommendation to the heads of, of government that the membership of that state be terminated. In fact, that is its only power. So in the, in the context of the SADAC case, the first case that has ever been brought before it on behalf of a number of uh, Zimbabwean farmers, um, if it rules in favor of the farmers and finds that the farmers' constitutional rights have been violated and therefore the SADAC protocol has been violated, um, all it can do is recommend that Zimbabwe uh, Zimbabwe's membership be terminated. Um, to, to a large extent, that question is now moot because I'm sure the answer would be given that, well, yes, we were in violation, but we now have signed this and we're moving forward. Um, Lawrence Freeman is still here. Uh, sovereignty in Zimbabwe. Your first question about the UK and US dangling millions of dollars and Billions. Um, Zimbabwe dollars or hard currency? <laughs> um, if it's Zimbabwe dollars, I can give a few billion out this afternoon. Um, I think that there are two ways of looking at this, uh, Lawrence. The, the one is to say, as you've said, that the, the US and the UK don't have, have that right to link it to, to Morgan Sangarai. But I think that there is another way of looking at, at it. And, and my understanding is that their policy is, is um, based on, on the second principle. And, and that is that Robert Mugabe is the person who has squandered aid for the 28 years and that we do not want to put any aid uh, into a country which may be further squandered by Robert Mugabe. So I think it's more linked to the power that Robert Mugabe has than to the power that Morgan Sangarai has. That's certainly my understanding. And I suppose the way it's been interpreted is that it is an either-or uh, situation. What this offers is uh, an interim power-sharing arrangement. And I hope that uh, they will if they have taken a hard line, that they will revise that and, as I said earlier, adopt a policy of um, perhaps drip feeding, hopefully more than just a drip, subject to certain benchmarks being met. But I don't believe that that 
uh, undermines our sovereignty. Uh, the second aspect of your question uh, that Morgan Tsangarai was supported by Western groups was acting under the influence of forces. I, I've been involved in the MDC since its uh, formation. I was a founding member. I was there at the 11th of September 1999. My, my roots uh, are in human rights. Um, I, for many, many years, uh, have been critical of the United States and and uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, I received my first death threat in 1994, not from the British government, but after I'd criticised the British government for giving Robert Mugabe uh, a knighthood. And I think that uh, many of us in the MDC, uh, in fact the majority of us, uh, have shown that we aren't lackeys of, of the West, that we've been very critical of, of Western policy. In, in the past. And so, yes, whilst there has been some influence of the West, I think it's uh, unfair to say, as Zanu PF does, as its principal propaganda line, that this is a, a creation of the West and, and largely subject to the influence of, of the West. Um, I think as well, one needs to say that the ANC and Zanu PF itself received substantial support from Scandinavian countries. They weren't branded as uh, agents of the West or neo neo-colonialist governments. Uh, and I think the MDC should be seen in, in a similar light. In fact, one of the ironies for me is that there, there has been a great amount of anger directed not so much at the United States government, but certainly the British government. Uh, Tony Blair, a couple of years ago, said in Parliament that the British government supported the MDC. In fact, one of the complaints within the MDC is that we've received no support from the British government. And that's a fact. Um, the, the MDC has received no direct support, and even it's the, the indirect support through civic groups has, has been minimal. Um, turning to Conrad's very important question um, uh, regarding um, litmus Test. Is Conrad still here? Is he? No, but there are it's others, gone. yes. Uh. I think that the, the, uh, uh, he, he spoke about Jock, and, and yes, Jock is, uh, is one of the litmus tests, but I think that um, the military, funnily enough, doesn't constitute our, our biggest challenge. I think that in some respects the military is going to be controlled through the finance ministry the amount of money that's allocated to, to the military will determine its strength. Uh, I think that the, the key litmus test, certainly in the next year, are going to be um, some of the following. For example, in Clause 19 of the agreement, it says that the government shall in, ensure the immediate processing, that's the, the phrase, immediate processing by the appropriate authorities of all applications for re-registration and registration in terms of the Broadcasting Services Act. In other words, uh, those organizations that have tried to set up radio stations and television stations and uh, those organizations that have had newspapers shut down uh, should be allowed to, to operate in, in the short term. And if they are not allowed, if obstacles are placed in, in their way, well, that, that is one test that will have uh, failed. There are other uh, areas that provide useful tests for example, the reform of the judiciary, and this touches on a question raised right at the end um, by um, Ms. I think Lawrence, if I got it right, yeah. about the, the institutions. I'll come back to that. But for example, the judiciary, I think, is, is an institution that can be reformed uh, relatively quickly and easily and cheaply. Um, there are many judges who were hounded out of office uh, who are now immigration judges in, the, in Britain longing to come back to, to Zimbabwe They're in, in the SADC region. Um, I think a test will be to see whether they're allowed to come back and take up um, positions as, as judges. Um, another litmus test will be in relation to the flow of humanitarian assistance mm -hmm. and the lifting of bans on, on NG NGOs to see whether they are allowed to, to distribute food um, the reform of legislation, uh, POSA and IEPA has been reformed, uh, has been amended in some respects, but 
is in need of you know, much greater reform. I have absolutely no doubt that the combined MDC in the lower house now has, now that it has the power to introduce legislation, is going to be introducing a wide range of amendments to uh, draconian legislation. Let's see how that is dealt with in the Senate, which Zana PF controls. If the Senate blocks it, um, if the president won't sign the legislation, well, then they've, they've failed those tests. Um, the implication of civic society's non-involvement in the negotiations. Uh, yes, that, that has been a, a serious problem. I think that the critical, um, and in a certain respect, this is a litmus test, the agreement says that civic organizations have to be included in the constitutional reform process. Um, it is vitally important that they are included in, in that. Uh, and I, I think that that will not only secure the legitimacy of the process, uh, but will also strengthen civic society for the, for the future. I'm really rushing through because I realize that we, we're out of time. Tony's question about the, the, the MDC, we could spend all night and the next th few weeks uh, discussing the splits in the opposition. Uh, I, I think the one thing that we can all agree on is that it played right into Robert Mugabe's hands. I don't buy the, the story that, that South Africa organized it. I've been intimately involved in this organization since day one. Uh, I think it was highly complex. I don't think it was something that, that could have been orchestrated from from South Africa um, no in, in fact that's a that is a total falsehood because one of the reasons why uh, the Mutambara formation got blown away in the election is because it was dreadfully underfinanced anyone in Zimbabwe will tell you that whereas Zanu PF could take page after page of, of advertisements in, in the press and, and they had radio and television adverts and exactly the same, if not more, was done by the MDC under Morgan Sangarai. The, uh, the MDC under Arthur Mutambara was woefully underfinanced. They didn't get any Western support. They certainly didn't get any South African uh, support. And it, it's not the only reason, don't get me wrong, why it didn't perform badly, but it is one of the reasons why it didn't perform. And it, it's the best demonstration that uh, we had no South African financing. Um, neither of us, our colleague from Kenya, has, has gone. Mm. Um, he asked the question, the key question, about what is the quality of the opposition? It's a bit unfair asking me. Uh, but I, I think let me answer the question in, in this way. We've, um, to put it mildly, had a baptism of fire in the last eight years. Uh, I think all of us are more noteworthy for our courage than, than our technical ability. Um, and th that, of course, is going to undermine uh, the, the, the quality that we can bring to, to the government in future. And it applies to all of us in both factions. Um, it can be addressed, though. Uh, Morgan Sangarai and Arthur Mutambara have some leeway in terms of this agreement. Each can bring in three new senators, can bring in technocrats, and hopefully that both Morgan Sangarai and Arthur Mutambara will use that power to bring in at least six people uh, who, who have the technical ability. Um, and... Of course, the civil service will have to be reformed. And a key element, uh, a key question that we haven't actually raised, uh, uh, which we need to raise in determining whether this experiment can work or not, is can we get uh, human resources back to the country? Uh, yeah. There's enormous talent. Uh, throughout the world, in Washington, in New York, in Johannesburg. And I think that a, a very important role that the West can play in that regard is in encouraging and perhaps financing uh, key people in the diaspora to come home with key skills to come, come home. 
to get them into the civil service, to get them into key jobs, to give back up to these highly courageous individuals who have been f literally fighting a war for the last eight years, do not have any experience in, in governance or in uh, ad advances in medicine and, and other aspects of society and will need that, that backup. Um, elite deals, we've spent a lot of time on elite deals. And, um, the, the question about uh, the priority institutions and th those that need to be strengthened. Uh, to reiterate a bit of what I said, one of the, the, the main reasons why Zimbabwe has got into the situation it is today is because our fourth estate was never uh, built up and strengthened. The fourth estate, the media institutions are critically important that there's a sh to ensure that there's a, a very short honeymoon that all of us are held accountable. We need to get independent radio stations, television stations, we need to get the daily news functioning again, we need to get SW radio uh, and, and institutions like that into the country operating quickly and I think that they can be built up quickly. There's a lot of expertise out there. Once again if there's targeted international assistance we can get those uh, groups up. I think the judiciary is all important and the Attorney General's office is all important. Uh, the one shining star, if you'll forgive me being slightly biased, is the legal profession. My colleagues in the legal profession in Zimbabwe uh, have stood firm and uh, they provide a very strong foundation to, to rebuild the judiciary and the Attorney General's office from. We can do it relatively easily. Um, the Independent Electoral Commission, in the, many of the uh, independent uh, commissions that are to be set up in terms of the constitutional amendment can be set up. There's lots of talent in the country and elsewhere, and, and they should. So I include the Media Commission, Human Rights Commission, Gender Commission. They, they are important. Um, I'm rambling. I, let me end. Um, the final question about uh, President Mbeki in South Africa, the implications uh, of, of a change in uh, the leadership in South Africa on, on Zimbabwe. Um, I, I don't think that uh, the change of, of <coughs> president in, in, in South Africa is going to have too much of, of an impact on Zimbabwe. If I could uh, somewhat humorously digress for a moment. Um, it may strengthen the one opposition faction because Welshman Mubi's son is marrying Jacob Zuma, Jacob Zuma's son, uh, daughter <laughs> in, in December. So <laughs> that familial tie may strengthen one, one of the opposition factions. No, but I'm, I'm being facetious. Um, I, I would, uh, let me end on a positive note. This agreement is, is fraught with problems, but we have to put it in the context of what is happening in Southern Africa. Um, in the recent SADC Heads of Government meeting, most of the media focus uh, was on the Zimbabwean deal. What the media didn't focus on was another agreement that was signed off on in that very same meeting, namely the removal of tariffs throughout SADC for all goods manufactured within Southern Africa in December. Uh, it's it's a, just a, a little glimpse of, of where the region is going. I think that Zimbabwe has been holding the whole region back. And I think that if we get stability, uh, irrespective of whether Jacob Zuma comes to power or whether he's prosecuted before he gets to power, I think that with Zimbabwe stabilizing, with the region moving ahead, um, Zimbabwe is going to, to progress in a lot quicker than we all hope for. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Karen, and thank you to all of you for your questions. Um, and to the Woodrow Wilson Center for giving people an opportunity to hear these comments. The next few months are indeed going to be crucial in Zimbabwe, and, uh, and the international community is going to have to um, be of assistance.
I, I certainly hope that in Zimbabwe, that uh, within the cabinet and indeed in, this, in the institutions around the cabinet, there will be sufficient attention given to the management of the solidarity support and the humanitarian support which is necessary and which will sooner or later have to come into the country in order to restore its economy and then to build its democracy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.